Hi, everybody. Um, so what I was asked to speak about today was the future of impact-based media. Um, and I, I, I think it's a really good way to start off this part of the, the film festival and games for change as a thing, because I feel like the intersection here is really interesting. Um, you know, the idea that, um, that the film festival, Tribeca Film Festival, has taken games for change into its sort of umbrella, and that games for change has wanted that partnership to exist, I think it speaks to something really fascinating about where we are. Because if you, I've been involved with, as, as Ingrid mentioned, the, the interactive work that's happened here. And what I find fascinating about it is we're really not just talking about films and games. I mean, of course, we're talking about you know, films and documentaries that are showing. We're talking about games. We're talking about uh, you know, VR work, like A Machine to Be Another. We're talking about uh, apps. We're talking about uh, like Karen, like last year, we were talking about interactive theater experiences like Door the Dark. All of these things were featured and are being featured over this period. So, everything from this war of mine, you know, in digital work, to a thing that you wander around in a physical space where someone talks to you, all fits into this broad category of stuff that we're interested in. Um, and that's impact based media. And I like talking about that. Um, and as clunky as a phrase as that is, I kind of like it. Um, the reason why I like it actually is because my field is fraught with issues about definition, it's fraught with questions about how we move and like what constitutes what we are. Um, and this is something that's been floating around games for a long time, and games have changed no stranger to it. So if you look at an experience like dysphoria uh, by Anne Anthony, and we ask ourselves, like, is this a game? Which is a conversation that happens all the time in games. Um, and we sort of question it. Well, it's got gameplay, and it's, it's got elements of interactivity that resemble games, but you can't really win, you can't really lose. There's not a sense of challenge in it in a really specific way. Um, if we look at experiences like Howling Dogs by Porpentine, and we think about it from an experience where there's very little choice. You basically navigate to where Porpentine wants you to go, and the experience is largely written. Your sense of agency is largely diminished. That's kind of the point of the piece. Is that a game? Um, we talk about uh, something like uh, pride, uh, and you know, this idea of experience like what pride is and how pride develops as a story. Is there any play in it at all, actually? Is there any way to go through it except the way that you're supposed to, or is your interactivity meaningful in any specific sense? And I think that set of relationships is, is kind of interesting, because if you ask this question in a strict way, uh, are these things games? Well, the answer is no, they're not. If in a formal definition of games, they don't need it. And that might be meaningful to developers, but honestly, who cares? They're consumed by the audience. And I think when we say this, we kind of forget something critical here. I can make a statement about artwork that defines artwork, right? I can take King Lear, and I can say quite sufficiently that King Lear is not a painter. But I haven't, by saying that, said anything about King Lear's quality. I can still say that King Lear is a masterpiece. I just acknowledge that it's not a painting. But again, what difference does that make to the audience? Why does the audience care? If the audience is moved by the experience of the witnessing of aging and madness and the relationships of families and how families can fall apart and the ideas of betrayal and love, does it really matter that we call it a play on painting to the audience? Does the audience care about that difference? And so, in my mind, talking about whether these things are games is sort of beside the point. They're all brilliant experiences. Dysphoria, pride, howling dogs, lots of work of mind, lots of interactive work that's coming out now. All of these things are amazing. And if we define them as games or not games, we're only doing it to help us make them better. We're only doing it to make more of them. But the audience doesn't care. It's not important to the audience, as long as the aesthetic is strong. And in these cases, the aesthetic is strong. And if they invent new forms to get to their aesthetic, that's fine. The goal is to get to the aesthetic, not to make a game. So this is, takes us back to this question of what impact these media is. And where we end up a lot of times with this when we look at that thing list I showed you is, is transmedia. Um, oftentimes when I get this B in a slide about transmedia, there's a palpable groan and depression from the audience. Uh, because everybody kind of knows what this is, and now we're gonna have to have a conversation about our, our, our good friend the transmedia checklist. So okay, we're gonna move forward with transmedia projects, so let's just you know, we have to have our feature, but let's make sure we have our book. Uh, and then I guess we're going to need a game, because like, the kids are going to want to do it. Uh, and then uh, we need a mobile somewhere, so we have to have an app. And then probably we want to have a website, too, because you know, like, there's so people who do that stuff. And then we're going to need some kind of YouTube series, because that's really what's going to buzz with Generation Z. And uh, the social networking component, absolutely. How's it going to survive that social networking component? And we go through our list and we say, check. 
Check. Check. Check. Check. Check. Check. Check. Impact. Right? Um, and this is obviously a really naive approach to this, but what I really want to talk about today is why. Like, like what, what what about this approach is naive? How, how could it be imagined in a different way? way? Because it's really going to articulate data for change in a position where there's data for change like the unit. And, and when the Tribeca Film Festival has an interactive component that has a, just a plurality of media that are all speaking to similar kinds of issues, what is it that we're trying to do? Why would we do any of these things? Like, what, what's the value of any of these enterprises? And if we're going to save the, what a lot of people feel like, like the grand enterprise of trans media, right? That we can actually bridge gaps between media with our messages. How do we do it in a way that doesn't feel perfunctory, which is where a lot of this stuff goes? And if you're unfamiliar with what I'm talking about, I just want to point out that this model is literally a model that you can hear in marketing departments around, around fiction properties all the time. And as I've worked on fiction projects and talked to people about you know, impact-based media as seen through a transmedia lens, like a brand that's going to spread, I, I have this conversation about you know, what is our website going to be sort of a priori of any consideration of like what the website would be. So the other part of it though that I think makes this really problematic is that oftentimes this isn't really seen in a, in a natural transmedia way. Oftentimes the feature is really the important thing. And what we really wanted to do was make a documentary. And everything else that was involved in it is sort of ancillary to the documentary. And so we're checking those boxes, but what we really wanted to do was make a documentary of all this is supported the documentary. Or maybe what we really wanted to do was make a game. And we just realized that we had to have other components to sell the game, market the game, and make it game popular. And if we could exploit the game someplace else, why wouldn't we do it? Or actually, maybe all we care about is just spreading the word about the issue. And if people just tweeted about it at the time, that'd be great. And maybe if you made a movie, they tweet about it. And from that perspective, the transmedia system seems really weak. It's like, why are we doing all of this stuff? If really all we cared about was the documentary in the first place. And like, if all I want to do is just get to the documentary, how is the approach really transmedia? That hierarchy starts to break down in a really strange way. And it leads to the kind of work that we see nowadays that like people are getting interested in transmedia, but really it's coming from a disciplinary approach. And that's what really fascinates me about this future is the possibility of getting outside of it. Now, the particular reason why I want to get outside of this has to do with the audience. Like, if you look at the way the audience is evolving in the world, we actually find that the audience doesn't care about these distinctions. And there's been a lot of research about what's been kind of called Generation Z. You may have seen stuff about Generation Z if you haven't. This is like the new marketing buzz term. Millennials are dead. There's a whole new revolution coming in terms of like, wow, how advertising is going to work and who it's appealing to. But if you don't buy into that hype and you just take seriously some of the findings that they get, um, what you find is that there's an evolution of how people are consuming media that's broad and speaks to a, a very fundamental difference in the understanding of media that existed before. The primary statistic, and this is a lot of the uh, JWT intelligence report, is that if you look at the types of media that children use every day and multiple times, you can actually see that there's multiple devices that the majority of users use every day and multiple devices that a minority of users use every day. And these are in ages where having access to these devices in an individual way is extremely low. So when you think about someone right now who's 12, who uses, uh, say, an iPod or a music player 25% of the time, you have to understand that the average user at that age, they are not the only person using that device. That device can be shared in a family. Like the tablet that a family has may be the only tablet a family has. So if the child uses it multiple times a day, that means even with very limited access, the child is using it multiple times a day. That means multiple children in the same family are using it multiple times a day. When people uh, like, like talk about generation Z in terms of media consumption, they talk about it as a five-screen consumption pattern, which is usually articulated a little outdatedly as laptop, desktop, smartphone, iPod, and television. So, if you ask people in this generation what kind of media they consume, you actually get a list that looks something like this. And I know this is not a parallel list. I know that Snapchat is next to a laptop, and those are not the same thing. I know that Vine lives on my phone. But that lack of distinction is, I think, what characterizes the idea of native digital life is that I don't really care where I consume it. 
if you, you haven't been paying attention to this, Snapchat is becoming a major platform for media production. Like people are producing whole narrative series all exclusively on Snapchat for people to consume. And I hope I don't have to tell the audience in the 21st century that like YouTube viewership makes up a large component of where media is going in terms of building out new brands. There are whole companies that are staking their whole life on the idea that YouTube-related content can be a media property in the 21st century. But the key thing that I think about this is that people aren't differentiating between these media, they just see them all as one thing. And if I look at a brand in one place, that's all I care about is the place that I looked at it when I found the brand. The idea that I would like concentrate exclusively on television shows as the center of my experience, I think is an outdated model. If I find it on my phone and I want to use it on my phone and I'm on my phone at the time, awesome. If it's a good experience on my phone, that was the brand. I'm not thinking about it necessarily in relationship to anything else. At uh, iKids, and the Kids Summit Conference, um, a, like a couple months ago, there was a presentation on Cartoon Network's Anything, where they basically just took an app and dumped 50 second pieces of content into a randomized app that kids consume. And that app is consumed by Cartoon Network audiences as part of the Cartoon Network experience. An app that spits them random content from Cartoon Network is seen as a kind of on-par experience with their television experience. That's a completely different world for us as we think about how these things move. And that speaks to transmedia in such a much deeper way than we've ever thought about it before. Because if my audience doesn't care when they see the content and they just want to see the content, then really I just want to reach them with the content. Um, now I want to take a moment right now to say that this is not a talk about business models at all. Um, and that is, as, as Ingrid mentioned, a major problem. Like we don't actually know how any of this monetizes in a real way. And we're really in deep flux about this. Advertising models have just begun to shift to the internet in an interesting way, and maybe that's going to change things. And certainly there are YouTube stars who make a lot of money doing what they do, but it's a very small number. And the question about what's going to happen to television advertising, especially in the light of what HBO Go is doing, is a real deep question about what's going to happen to the industry, and I'm not really interested in talking about that right now. Because it's a bigger question than I could possibly cover in this space, and it really doesn't get at the heart of what we're talking about, which is impact-based media. And obviously being able to monetize and being able to make a living doing this is critical. But if what we're really interested in in this question is how we reach people and how we make impact, then I think what we really want to do is ask ourselves where we can reach people. And if we can reach people on these platforms, then we want to exploit these platforms as well as we can. So when we think about impact, aside from business model, and we ask ourselves like what we're thinking about, I mean, it could be a range of things, and we, again, know this from the kind of work that we do. We could be talking about just raising awareness around an issue that's unrecited, or bringing attention to something that people don't know. It could be an educational content, where we're basically saying, an issue that you already know about is maybe something that you need to understand more about. Do you know how your food is produced? Do you know where the, the gas you use comes from? Might that change your purchasing decisions if you do that? Might you be more interested in a political topic if you understood more about how the political topic impacted your life? We might be looking at it as a direct call to action, like the idea of impact might be that at the end of this experience you will do something, you will donate money, you will volunteer, you will go out and make changes in your life and make changes for other people. Um, and we can think, especially in the light of things that have happened in the last couple of years, in terms of growing social movements, that maybe these are just pieces of larger experiences. Um, it is, is not going to be surprising to any of you that there are pieces about Ferguson that have appeared in the interactive day, and that Black Lives Matter is becoming a bigger and bigger topic in interactive media. It's not surprising that that could be an ecosystem where the creation of that work will perpetuate more interest. So for all of these issues, what we're really concerned about is finding the people and getting the message to the people. So as we make this work, what we really want to think about are those two questions. Like the question of medium is not important to the audience, except insofar as it's the way they consume. So if I'm making a property that I want to have impact, what I want to ask myself is a handful of really essential questions. Who am I trying to reach? Because that's going to determine where they are. And where do they live in that media? Like, which, which devices are they on? What does their age determine? What does their economic level determine? What does their just general consumption pattern determine? As you watch, for example, things like social media, and you realize that audiences in Facebook and Twitter and Instagram are different age groups, different demographics, different racial distributions. Like, these are very different platforms, and the, the audience you want to reach is going to be determined by those questions. What do they want from that media? Like, what are the terms of that medium when they approach it? Like, how, when you make a game, are you speaking to other game players? And what do game players expect from games? 
What do people who watch YouTube series expect from YouTube series? When I'm engaged in a, in a conversation on Twitter, what does that look like and why do I do it? Like, so that when I build things for that platform, I'm thinking about what they are. And then finally, which media actually fits my message? given all of these questions. Like, it may be that the thing that I want to try to document is not interesting to an audience that's on a website. Or that it's not interesting to an audience that's not, doesn't have easy smartphone availability. Or requires a kind of connectivity to other users that, that have a platform that's going to connect. Maybe it's something that's highly systemic and it speaks easily to gameplay. Maybe it's something that's very, story-based and deals a lot with the empathy with particular characters, and that might speak to more narrative formats that are more direct, like a, like a film. When I put those pieces together, I come up with something that's a different way of thinking about transmedia. So what I'm really arguing for here is the death of the transmedia checklist. I think the transmedia checklist is useless. I think if we don't approach transmedia from an intelligent perspective of asking ourselves where our audience is and what our audience is looking for and how we can best reach our audience to the impact goals that we're trying to reach, we're wasting money and we're wasting time. What we want instead is what I think of as a transmedia ecosystem. And I mean ecosystem in the traditional sense of ecosystem, right? I mean that like, there's a bunch of things that live in an environment, they all intersect in interesting ways. You know, so in a natural environment, you might have like, this kind of really basic format of an ecosystem, which is that there are producers, and then things that consume the produced things, and then there are things that recycle the consumed produced things that go back to the producers. And then the natural relationship between all of those things is like a reason why, when you look at the system, the pieces line up the way they do, they all build towards each other. Of course, in natural systems, this is all bottom up, it all evolved that way. But if we're planning projects, we can think of projects this way too. If we know that we want to have things that are going to intersect in interesting ways, we can plan that from the beginning. And that leads us to a completely different understanding of how transmedia works. So I know this is a little bit small on the screen, so I'm gonna walk you through it a little bit. This is what a transmedia ecosystem looks like. I wanna give a big thank, shout thank you to Dana Dentro of uh, the National Support of Canada because he helped me make this. This is actually uh, uh, the, the transmedia uh, ecosystem for a project that we're working on. I've blocked out anything that would make it sensitive, but I wanted to show you what this thing actually looks like. So if you can't see this very well from the back of the room, um, basically what you're looking at is a chart of four different experiences that would be part of a single transmedial experience. There's a film component, there's a website, an interactive map, there's an installation, and there's a game. Uh, this came about out of a set of brainstorming meetings that happened at the inception of the project. So when the project was originally ideated, and it was ideated from the film first, there was a discussion of all of these media at the beginning, as well as other possible media that we could explore, and these were the four that we settled on. One thing I want to point out to you is there is no app on this. There's also no interactive theater component, no locative component, and the reason why is because they didn't make sense. So we just decided not to do them. Now, if we zoom in closer to some of the elements of this, we'll start to see how this works. Right, the film was designed in its, in its understanding to be an emotional, confidential documentary, right? And so the reason why the film existed, even though the film was the seed, right? That's where the whole project started, was with this idea of a documentary. We recognized that the documentary served certain purposes really well, and we wrote them down as descriptors so we could keep track of them. It could be concise, it could be investigative, because it could dig deeper into individual stories. It could be heartfelt and emotional because it could really focus on like telling the stories of individual people who were involved in the issue. And it could be somewhat accusatory, but it could kind of tie itself back to a solution. Because we have the power of a linear media, we can leverage that to tell a story that's complete, that's rich, that's deep, that's human, right? And that's what the film should do. When we look at the game, we have a different set of adjectives here, right? Like emotional is still what we want, but we start getting into things like shocking and challenging and surprising. Because what we wanted the game to do is shock people. We wanted the game to be kind of a slap in the face about the issue. And the gameplay could do that because the gameplay could be more focused and concise on the system in a way. It was not gonna do as good a job at telling a deep human story as a film could be. But what it could do is embody the system in a way that, in, that embedded the user into the system. Like the user could be immersed in that system. And that meant that the user could have a completely different emotional experience than the film could produce. And that made the game valuable. So when we looked at these two objects, we didn't think of them as replicating each other at all. We saw them as completely separate components of the same message. But the key thing is that it was always the same message. 
We were looking at all of these as pieces of the same message. So could we make a game effectively that could slap you in the face with an issue, but a film that could tell a deeper story of the issue? So that if you intersected with either one of them, you would get the issue, but you would get it in a flavor that made sense, in a game, in an exciting, decision-making, intense way that sort of forced you to be in the position that we wanted you to think about, and in the film, in a humanized, emotional, investigative way that lets you explore deeper the lives of people who were in that experience. And all of these things relate. So as we think about building these things, we think about how they all connect. So the website connects to YouTube in a pretty natural way. Maybe like there's these generated content they share on YouTube through the website. Um, the website can obviously push to the film, maybe even host the film. And the social shares can drive back to the film show, and the game can link out to these things. The game can reach an audience that probably would never see a documentary, would never think they see a documentary. And a lot of that documentary audience, uh, um, that the documentary audience would never think to look at a game. So not only can we think about these things as individual objects that can speak to the issues in particular ways, we can think about them as a strategy, like a general impact strategy. And maybe if what I really want to do is have, let you have the experience and let you hear the stories of the experience at the same time, I can build out my experience so that you get both of them because they all relate. It's an ecosystem. You play the game, you have the experience, and at the end we tell you there are more experiences like yours, and we push you to a website and a documentary so you can see them. And you as a user who might never have watched a documentary might suddenly become interested in hearing more of those stories. That's only possible if all of this happens at the same time. And if the ecosystem is designed at the same time, that gives you an additional thing that I think is often not thought about in the production of these properties, which is a rollout strategy. Maybe it's really key to make a user-generated website. Maybe I have a lot of Twitter followers, and I know that I can, if I blast something on Twitter with a short YouTube video, I can get a bunch of people there fast. Maybe I know I can finish the game in the build-up to the documentary. So why wouldn't I just organize my whole schedule around that? Why wouldn't I just build everything at once and think about it that way? If I know I'm going to go through my chance to build a checklist anyway, if I know I'm going to build these things for some like obscure marketing purpose that I don't know, why wouldn't I stop at the beginning and just plan them all out in a row and think about how they could all have the, the impact that they should have? Could I build an audience for my documentary by giving people a crazy interactive experience up front? So suddenly people know about a topic they've never thought about before. Or could I take a VR experience and push something into a VR experience to give people an embodied sense that then asks them to call to action on the website somewhere else? And what would that look like if I really did it from like a holistic way? So when I think really about what the future of impact-based uh, media is, I think about those kinds of relationships, and I just imagine scenarios that could exist, right? I imagine in an organization like ProPublica launching like an interactive comic app about a community development project that solicits stories that get put into a data visualization that builds into a frontline piece. I think about what if Blackfish would have released in a television audience, also released simultaneously on Google Cardboard, so you could actually swim with it. The animals. And your empathy for the animals would be even greater from that kind of emergency. I imagine the world where the Wall Street Journal the companies is investigative reporting with a digital game that allows you to explore corporate Malfians by being someone who participates in the Malfians. So you not only read about the story, but you actually experience the pressures that those people are under and you understand why they do it. And I imagine maybe the Institute of Health releasing a short YouTube video series about the different ways that, that their environment is affecting their health and then making an augmented app that shows them that environment as they walk around. Now, if you're in this field, you know that the future I'm describing is like sort of right on the horizon because these are probably the conversations you're having. And if you're not, you should know these are the conversations that I'm having. We have issues to get here. This is not the world we live in yet. Um, but I really want to imagine a world where the next gone home is produced by It Gets Better. And then it links to a website that tells teenagers who are struggling with issues around their identity and the relationship to people with their sexuality where they can get help, the risks involved in running away, and what support networks look like. That's a completely imaginable world from right now. It's a world we're just stepping into. And it's a world that I think, as, as all the pieces start to come together, as we start to figure out what the business models are, as we find out more where the audience are and what they want, as we understand our world as a transmedia world, because that's the world we're in. Because all of us who consume media on one screen are going away. 
And we're going away in the face of an intelligent, complex, multi-screen ecosystem where everyone is consuming everything in a variety of platforms. It's not the crazy, simple multitasking that anybody ever talks about when they make this simple and stupid. It's not this idea of digital nativeness where every 12-year-old is a master coder. But it's a world in which the, the idea of narrative properties, the idea of gameplay, the idea of messaging in general ceases to live in a single platform. And the idea of a story world that people in the transmedia have been pushing for the last 10 years is a reality. But the joy of that world is it means that our audiences aren't limited. We only have to find them on the platforms there are. And if we can target those platforms to the audiences, we can reach more people. We can get our calls to actions, our educations, our social movements out to audiences that we never have seen in our original media. And we can create partnerships that get reached that's, I think, unimaginable by contemporary standards. Now, there's a lot of pieces we have to get to get there. We need developers who are interested in this kind of relationship. We need to, I need to break out of silos, and maybe that's why I gave this talk, is because the thing that makes me the most hopeful about having been through Tribeca's interactive day as part of the Tribeca Film Festival and landing here at the beginning of Games for Change is the thought that all of us, I think, are interested in this because we're having these conversations at all, because all of these people are partners. And I think it just takes more of us who are experts in all these fields to be asking these questions. The advocacy groups that we work with need to be open-minded about these possibilities, and we all have to be exploring these frontiers together. You know, these things are going to get solved by somebody. I would love for it to be solved by social good stuff first. Uh, the funding structures have to get more innovative around this. I think this is something that's evolving as we go and it's getting better every year. But we're still in an environment where I think a lot of this funding is siloed and as it begins to break down and start exploring more options and think about itself more broadly. And I think the work of institutions like Tribeca and Sundance and Power of the Pixel has done a lot to make this possible. Uh, we're going to see more and more of these possibilities rise up. And most importantly, we need to start cultivating this audience. We need to start thinking about how this audience can approach us in a meaningful way. If we believe anything that we read about Generation Z, the idea is that these are people who are much more motivated by social causes than came before, and that they participate more in charities and they volunteer more. This is an audience that is growing up right now that is primed for the messages we're sending. But they're looking at them in five different places. So those are the places we need to be, too. And I think if we can do that, that's how media arrives at impact. Thank you. So I have two of the left. I don't know if you want to. I assume I'm not being shoot off stage immediately. So if there are questions that people want to ask or thoughts people want to raise, uh, feel free. Yes. Uh, so the question is, uh, have I looked at, at how this work is, is, is being used in developing countries in terms of the media that are being, uh, being used there? Yes, and actually that's a really big part of the reason why I talk about this question. If you look at, uh, I did a lot of work, for example, with USAID in Indonesia, and looked at the way that, that, that media is consumed in Indonesia as part of research into whether disaster preparedness could be propagated through like, an Indonesian society through gameplay. And in, according to all of the NGOs we talked to, it was reaching kids, reach kids, reach kids. But what we found is like smartphone penetration is much lower, and the smartphones that you see are on these like Chinese $100 Android phones that you can't run Angry Birds on. Um, so if you're going to reach somebody there right now, uh, like a typical smartphone game will work, even though they're interested in those kinds of smartphone games, you'd actually have to design them to a, a different technology level. And of course, social networks are different in different places. Um, access to computers are different in different places. Uh, the idea of a home computer is very different, for example, in certain Asian countries than it is in other places. So if you're thinking about impact in specific places, it's really critical that you study the audience in those places. Media cultures are always savvy. They just have different access and different needs. Uh, but what, you know, the most interesting part of that is we talked very heavily about just distributing a pirated game. Because there were so many pirated consoles that we figured it would be a really easy way to reach people. And maybe that's an effective strategy for a social media call. Other questions? Great. Well, thank you for having me and enjoy the rest of your game session.